Good morning. Uh, as you guys all know me, you've seen me before, and I'm not sure why I agreed to talk twice, but here we are. This is the world premiere of this uh, presentation for all of us, including myself. <laughs> so we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah. HTML renders. Everybody still using old Windows GUI if you're on Windows, or has everybody moved on at this point to better and greater things? Uh, Linux, Mac, well, you wouldn't be using Quad WC on those things. Um, well, the latest and greatest thing that came out of dialogue after .NET was the HTML render, which is a very fancy version of a web browser. If you want to upgrade your GUI, this is all you need to do. You're done. You don't need anything else. I'm not kidding. That's everything you need. No, I am kidding. This is just the second half of your career. <laughs> um, and now comes the time to learn new technology as much as some don't want, so the next slide is actually very important. A lot of these things are going to be my opinions, and they're going to be very strong opinions. I think they're right, but they're not the only way of doing things. So don't take anything personally if I offend anybody's workflow, uh, but I will defend mine to death. <laughs> um, all right. So why the HTML render? There are a lot of reasons. It really is a wonderful piece of technology, and John Daintree, I think, was the primary person that put it in, and we love it. Uh, we'll first see if Sharp didn't work when we tried loading it. So I think we, I tried it last conference, and there was a couple other users that had a hard time loading the .NET library. Uh, it's Chromium, so it's Chrome. IT is now comfortable with Chromium, and they know what they're getting. You also know where it's coming from, so you could audit the source. Very important. Quad WC. For us, our application is an old Windows 32 application. We use Quad WC very heavily, and we can't just throw out 20 years of UI and start fresh. As much as I would love to, it's not doable. So with Quad WC integration, we can sprinkle the web browser throughout the application without the users even knowing they're using the web browser, because you can make the browser mimic an application that's 20 years old. It takes more work to make something work bad than you imagine. Uh, quad JSON. This is probably the most important thing to make all this work. The browser loves JavaScript, and JavaScript loves JSON. To do the I.O. between the interpreter and the HTML render over JSON it really makes everything seamless, and namespaces are very important here, too. It's also fast. Uh, HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript. I call this the triad, and it's something you're going to need to learn. As much as there are higher powers that would love to hide this from you, you need to understand this technology if you're going to use it. I swear it's not that bad after the first two months of frustration of smashing your head against the wall. Um, so there's that. Uh, you want modern uh, interfaces. So your users, especially anybody coming out of school, they don't want to use what we're providing them. It's and not intuitive, it doesn't make sense. They want to be able to put it on their phone, turn the phone, have it respond. They want to be able to scale it. They want the dots per inch to look good, which is really hard with Windows 32 stuff. Uh, so responsiveness. If I mention responsive, that means that the page or your UI automatically adjusts to the form factor it's being displayed on. So if you have it on your laptop, you flip the laptop, the page readjusts to look right. You put it on your phone, it readjusts. On your TV, it just automatically happens if you design your CSS right. More reasons. Um, there are countless libraries, development tools, and most important, there are developers. Um, you know, you can roll your own framework, JavaScript, and most of you will because you're APL developers, but at the same time, you can actually hire people. And you don't need to tell them anything about APL. You just need to give them an access point that they can understand as a server. Um, I've tried this. I was able to go on these third-party resource websites like Upwork. Um, I forget what the other one was. But basically, I'm like, here is a web server with a couple endpoints. Here's a couple pictures of my Windows GUI that I want to replicate. Write it for me. Two hours later, I had a fully functioning interface. And I was able to plug it right in. It was marvelous. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the browser is very error tolerant. When you mess up your Windows GUI or Unix or whatever, I don't know if you work in Unix, I can't comment, things go bad. You get syntax error, domain errors, value errors, you get pop ups that you're not expecting. When you mess up the browser, 
usually nothing happens. Um, so you're not crashing anything. It's just the user didn't get an expected result, so they'll try it again. That is actually quite powerful once you realize that you can code for that and you're not taking down your application. You're just finding another way of reset, resetting it. Um, PDFs. Uh, turns out when you have a very well-structured HTML document with good CSS, you can generate print-level documents also. CSS has a media CSS version of it, so you can define very granular documents with headers, footers, page numbers, locations, margins, all that stuff is there. Now, I'm going to mention this again later, but just because it's there doesn't mean it's well-supported. The browser actually supports the media version, the print media version of CSS, not that well. There are third-party tools that actually have full support for it, and something I could discuss with everybody. Um, oh, web components. This is really cool. You could define your own heading, label, doesn't matter. So a web component is a JavaScript file. It essentially mimics a HTML tag that is reusable by anybody. You could send them this CS JavaScript or have them download the web, and then all they have to do is uh, put in a tag called Norbert is a genius, and it's going to do everything by itself. It's a fully self-contained DOM, and it's uh, wonderful for creating your own UI libraries. I think a lot of the big ones, like React, Vue, are starting to actually move to native web components, now that the support is very well established. Future proof. Um, it is my personal opinion that you should write your desktop application as if it was running on a server. So even if you're, I'm going to show you CAS, which I've shown before, and I'm going to have HTML render in it. HTML render thinks it's running over the web. It does not know the difference, which is awesome because I could take that same GUI and throw it in the browser, and everything happens the same way. It's, um, that's the only way you should be doing it. Now, I know there are thoughts that you should be able to write your GUI from APL. I'm not going to argue that's wrong, but I think it's counterproductive and you're going backwards. Um, OK, so what took so long? HTML render came out, version 16, was it, John? Sometime back there. Um, initially, it crashed. And when it crashed, it took down the interpreter every time. So in testing, I can't even tell you how many APL cores we had. They were uh, numerous, and they were not easily repeatable, but they were happening a lot. So we can't install something on a user machine that we can't explain why it's crashing. With time, we've realized there's missing features. The biggest one initially was no idea what method was used. So if you're writing your application as a web page, you're using REST, so you're using get, put, patch, delete, head, op option, um, or opinion, no, it's option. There was no way of knowing what it was. Dialog very quickly fixed that, so now you could actually have proper terminology in your code. Execute JavaScript, I think it's supposed to be execute JavaScript async. It lets APL tell the browser to execute some JavaScript, either calling a function or injecting JavaScript directly. That's actually really important when you're integrating your UI with the old with Quad WC stuff, because sometimes the browser being asynchronous, doing its thing, and then Quad WC hosting it, there's threading issues. So even if your browser decides to tell your main application to do something, your main application is not going to do it because it's waiting on something. And we'll go over that. Acceptance. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you guys have a hard time giving up control of the full stack. Uh, and that's going to happen. Bringing in external talent, they're going to have different ways of doing things, including setting up the UX, UI interfaces. Um, it's not a bad thing. I mean, Google and Microsoft and everything, they put a lot of resources to telling us how to do things. I'm not saying they're right, but they're different ways. Apprehension, um, we want to build everything ourselves. We don't want to use different technology. I think we're at the point where we need to accept that APL is a tool in a large ecosystem. I mean, we look how long we've been talking about AWS, and now almost everybody in this room is in some way thinking about it. APL framework. So this was a tough one. Just because I can put up a web page in a form doesn't really do anything for me, especially if I have an application that's got error handling, modal forms, saving these GUI properties, reopening them, yada, yada, yada. 
that had to be solved and we did it. The other problem was our quad WC used namespaces to store all our information. And they were fine, except we could not quad JSON them because we had a lot of internal referential issues. So we also couldn't save our component files with later versions of APL. So finally, we went through the process and all the complex data structures in the application were re rewritten as quad JSON compatibility namespaces. So quad JSON is probably the most important thing out of all of this, which also allows you for easy IO, as I've mentioned before. Uh, data structures, as I just said, all our binary data structures that we used to store as namespaces and component files are now stored as serialized JSON objects. And now we're able to save component files again, which we were not able to. Oh, is um, HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, I call this the triad. They all go together. You really can't learn one without the other. Accept it. I, I don't know how much you're going to fight it, but accept it. If you want to build rich applications that act the way your new users expect them to act, you're going to need to dabble in all these technologies. Um, HTML5 by itself is wonderful. It can lay out everything, but right off the bat, it already looks and feels dated. The tactile feeling of the application is not there if the interactions aren't there, and that's what JavaScript and CSS gives you. Um, oh, asynchronously. So the browser is asynchronous. When you press a button, it does something, and the rest of the page continues. You press another button, it's going to continue. So you have to think in a way of your application design that you click something and you let it do its thing and expect something to pop up later. Um, as JD was talking yesterday, asynchronous application development is, uh, is hard, even though it's easy. Um, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, yeah. Oh, tooling. Has anybody tried Visual Studio Code yet? Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, I live in it besides the IDE now, which I think is still the standard. Visual Studio Code is my next go-to, and it's because it's supported everywhere. It has an online version. I can right now go on my phone, open up visualstudiocode.com, I think it is, and I could work in it, same as if I was on the desktop or a Mac or Unix. Uh, plugins, it does everything. It's its own little operating system, basically. So, and I'll show you this later in my workflow. It's got a live server, so you can actually host its own. As you're developing your web pages and your code, you can actually host it and look at it immediately. So, if you look at this here, I have my page, and this automatically refreshes it as I'm working on it. It makes it really easy to work on it when you can see it. Um, autocomplete, so, you know, if you're typing in JS dot DOM something, it'll give you suggestions if you download the plugin. It has the same development tools for debugging as Chrome, Edge, and HTML render, so you have a familiar place to actually debug your code. Linter, spell checkers, Git, doc, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, this may sound bad, but developers, right? We're all tools for somebody else's business, essentially, but now we can get more tools that do things better than we can if we don't know how to do it. Um, there are things I did not understand in JavaScript to make them work the right way, or at least how it's expected for somebody that's been working in the application for a long time. I'm able to go online and either hire a consultant or just go into Stack Overflow and get that help really easily. And it has nothing to do with APL, it's just that we're moving into a new arena that has a lot more talent than we're used to actually dealing with. And there's some very smart people out there. Um, oh, I already said PDF and document generation. This is very important for us at the Carl Group. We went from having installing a printer driver to actually drawing the document on the printer driver itself directly. And I forget what the quad command is, but we specified, you know, the the points are going to start here, the margin starts here. That is very difficult to maintain, especially when you're creating PDFs. So with HTML and CSS, if your document is laid out well, and this is very important, you have to have a well laid out semantic document, and your CSS works, your display is gorgeous on the screen and it's displayed everywhere. Now, your PDF that you generate from the browser or through a third party library will not necessarily look the same way as your web page because you'll have a separate style sheet for it. And that is designed for printing because it's going to deal with pagination, footers, headers, 
how things fit on pages. The browser doesn't care about that. You could stretch as much as you want and you could scroll it. A, web, a fixed page does not do that. So we now have a single source for generating documents and that is really neat. Um, as I mentioned before, the browsers, all the browsers really lack some granular support for print media, which has to do with laying out your headers and footers. So you have to think about that. There are open source libraries in JavaScript that will take care of most of that for you. Um, a much smarter person than myself found that there's a third party library that we license that actually we just pass some HTML into it and it produces a PDF for us. And it's by the guy that actually designed CSS 20 years ago. He started his own company. Uh, debug tools, common development tools. So HTML render, Chrome, Edge, I don't think uh, Firefox it looks the same, but it's the same tooling for all those browsers. So if you're developing in one, you know how to use the other. Um, and also Visual Studio Code will host this. So again, you have a common set of tools to work in. And once you're familiar with them, it's easy to bop around. Integration considerations. Um, there has been and there is no way to upgrade the CEF library right now. When 17.0 came out, we gave it first solid look at putting out the HTML render into our application. We very quickly found there was a very nasty bug in that version of CEF. It's one that Google found to be very critical and they basically suggested everybody upgrade their browsers immediately because it allowed uh, remote code execution. There was no way to upgrade CEF um, or the one HTML render. We had to wait for the next major version of the interpreter. That is, um, that's a problem. So, but obviously I think it's being addressed. It's a very large distribution package. We went from being 30 megabytes to 150 megabytes all in. That's, uh, that's another consideration. Working with the clipboard, once you're in the web browser and you have a grid, also known as a data table now, the clipboard doesn't work the same way you expect it in Windows. Um, we also don't have the clipboard API access if you've worked with JavaScript at all. So you have to take into account how you're designing your UI, maybe not to rely on the clipboard to be more keyboard oriented. Um, as I mentioned before, when the HTML render crashes, it crashes everything. So take that for what you will. UI threading, oh gosh, there's so much stuff. In, um, in our instance, we run quad WC in thread zero, and then we host the HTML render inside that thread. If, for example, I'm, I tell, if my APL tells the browser to do something and I expect it to send a result, I will never get that result because I'm quad DQ'd and the HTML render process, the form cannot actually process their response. It sounds trivial, but it really makes things difficult because when you're trying to interact with the two separate systems, you can't. You have to have tricks such as long polling, um, data binding on the, what I call the client side now for the HTML render. Um, so let, let me rephrase it because everybody will run into this if you're hosting the HTML render. It's not a bug as we found out, we thought it was originally. But if your APL session tells the HTML render to do something and you expect it to send a result to you and you're waiting on the APL site for the event with the result to do something, it won't do it because the same thread is on a DQ waiting for something while you're waiting, it's blocking to actually process the result. It sounds trivial, but it really makes things difficult. And this is something hopefully Dialog will make easier for us at some point. DOM size, um, if you're using grids, keep your, use virtual scrolling. You don't really want to have more than 50,000 rows in a web page. It just slows everything down. I think the native Chrome process has about a gigabyte limit of RAM and then you just don't want to draw all that stuff anyway. Web sockets, you know, they're awesome, they're fast. You could create your own interface behind the scene, your own uh, protocol, everybody likes doing that. I tend to stick with just HTTP commands because they work over the web really easily and they're cacheable and the rest is just nice for myself. Um, images. Everybody's got bitmaps, PNGs. Once you put it on the browser, it lets you scale things. All of a sudden it looks really bad. 
So we actually took all our bitmaps, we paid somebody, and they recreated everything as SVGs. So now that's no longer a problem. We could just place them anywhere, and they just look good. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna go over five or six places where we integrate the HTML render inside our old application. And I'm gonna tell you why I did it this way and considerations along the way. And we're very slowly doing this because there's a lot of logic in the application that's been put in that's hard to recreate unless you have the skills which we're just learning. The first one, oh, I forgot about this. The HTML render has this wonderful PDF viewer, which is 32 and 64 bit but it also has uh, two little quirks. The one is the download button, you see the down arrow? When you click the down arrow, it's not gonna do anything if you open it up as a file. So if you just point the HTML render to the .pdf on the disk and you click that, it just does nothing. It's an empty button, it looks bad for the user because you expect it to do something if it's there. The next thing is if you actually serve it up as if it through the on HTTP request command, you will, um, It'll work, but when you click it, it just it gives you a blind request. You actually don't know somebody clicked the button. All you get is a get to the HTTP dialog route. Not really a problem, it kind of bothers me though. Um, oh, going back to the file, if you open it up with a file directly, at that point there will be a file name right here. So if you use temporary file names or quirky names, that's gonna show up there. So little things like that you're gonna run into that you're not expecting yet. Uh, this is actually an interesting one. When 18.2 came out, we jumped right to user config files. One of the initial problems was you could not define a splash screen in a user config file. I think that has since been addressed, but we recreated the splash screen using HTML render. So now the first thing that happens in the application, it loads it up. And that forced us to recreate the logo in SVG, which is even better because now no matter what size monitor somebody opens this on, either it's you know low HD monitor or 5K monitor, Everything just scales beautifully and it looks right. The other huge benefit is when the splash screen loads, we're doing a whole bunch of startup routines in the application. That is a great time to load up the CEF library. The initial load up on Windows we find can be anywhere between one and five seconds, which is a long time if you click into a grid and then your page is kind of blank for the first time. So we load up all the libraries initially during the startup. It adds about a second to startup, but it doesn't matter. Um, we had a, we have an activation scheme in the application that somebody goes to the activation server and they do some stuff. It was originally written in .NET 2. When we moved to version 18, with uh, scaling being a little bit different with the interpreter, the .NET library looked like crap. It just, it looked small, it did not scale properly, there was no way really to override it. So this was the first time we actually used the application with HTML render. And I wrote up a little server on the APL side in CAS, and I said, okay, you know, get this, put the code here, get a response. And it was the first time I hired somebody to do my job. Um, it was very interesting. I spun up a WebSocket in my desktop, and I wrote up a little uh, spec, oh, thank you, Andy, that says, you know, this, this endpoint does this, this one does that, this is what you expect, and I put up a bid online, and Two hours later, I hired somebody and he was hitting my local machine. I opened up a socket and developing this thing. And I had this whole thing re recreated in HTML5 in about three hours from a stranger online. And I was able to scan the code and it does exactly what it needed to do. It's also self-contained and it's very easy excuse me, to generate tests for somebody else to work on this because you're already working with JSON. So you could create test data very easily that they could consume and serve themselves if they want it. Um, application help, we rewrote the application help. All our help is stored in Markdown, which is just a fancy way of saying text files. We also use some JSON. Um, we took the opportunity to rewrite the help as HTML page, so it's now hosted online, and we can also show the same exact thing in the application with the HTML render. It also prints really nicely. For the longest time, and every time somebody asks us to give them a PDF, we just asked them, well, why do you want a PDF of 10,000 pages? I mean, I still don't know why, but they do. Um, so that's great. Oh, this is kind of cool. Uh, we put an audit log in the application, so as think people are clicking stuff, you can actually see a full history of it. Now, did we need HTML render for this? No, but it's a good way to try using it. Um, it's simple. So 
something happens in APL, we put it into a little variable that's logging and there's a server running the whole time. This little applet goes up, somebody puts it up and it just has a little JavaScript with a timer that just every five seconds calls the web server in APL and gets any updates. I don't need to update the HTML GUI, it just does it by itself. And if it goes down or somebody turns on and off, there's no management, it just works. Uh, data view, so you could see in here, this whole box is actually an HTML render. We designed it so it looks like a Windows Quad WC form and the interaction, and it was the first, that was the first actual foray into putting this in the main application. I know it's not clear, but the whole thing here is an HTML render. When you click this, it'll actually bring up a Win32, a Quad WC form. When the Quad WC form closes, it actually updates the HTML render. It's pretty cool. The problem was, we're right here. We click view, this opens. When I click calculations, I need to know what's on this page. But when I tell, when I click, when the on change event happens, I tell this HTML render, give me your data, send it to me. Remember I said I can't do that, I can't process it if the quad DQ is waiting for it to do something. So that was a very quickly something we had to solve. Data binding on the HTML render side. Every time something changes and the, the JavaScript knows to just push it immediately to the main application. So as soon as I make an update, the main application already has the full data structure of what's in the HTML render. And that works when it's local because it's very quick. You're just using a pipe, I think. Um, yeah, there's thread switching, uh, HTTP request, and WebSocket receive. All the events basically will not function while you have everything dequeued in the same frame. Uh, all right. Okay, this is where um, this, this is where my opinions start coming in. Um, obviously, the, there's no upgradability right now, and that seems to be getting taken care of. Windows users, uh, this is a gotcha that we ran into recently. We've started testing the HTML render with rolling out the installation. So we install the application on their program files, which is a read-only directory, or you would hope. Windows update happened at a client site while the application was running, and we were missing two files that are required for HTML render now in the installation. And the next time they started the application, it just crashed with an APL core because it was relying on them. Um, we can't replicate it. We know it's not a Windows Defender issue. So far, the biggest thing we've narrowed it down to is there was an update to Teams and WebView 2 around the same time that this happened. I don't know where else we're gonna go from that or then try to, try to replicate it. So something that's happened to us, and if it happens to you, just know that you may be missing some files where you should never be missing files. Uh, the threading we talked about, oh, on Windows, any reason we can't just plug in WebView 2 to work instead of distributing to all of CEF now? Yeah, it's it just, you know, it, it's there. We may not need to actually send all that information out, and Edge is Chromium. Uh, oh, what you need to think about is authentication authorization. They're not the same thing. Authenticate is, you know, you log into the system. Whether you're authorized to do something on it is a whole different thing. So keep that in mind when you develop the application. Um, oh, this is a good one. Every time I'm looking for a fancy grid in JavaScript, I search grid, and that's a totally different thing in JavaScript and APL. A grid in JavaScript is a layout mechanism, how you put your things on your web page. So if you're looking for grid terminology, it's a data table. So keep that in mind. Um, okay, I'm gonna go over my time by a minute here because I'm just gonna do it. If you're doing new development, and this is very controversial, and your first thing you do is a HTML render, right? Quad WC. No. Um, it's there because it's a shim to moving out, upgrading your application to the latest standard. You really want to be writing your application as a web server. Be it Jarvis, Rumba, you're probably going to write your own. Go figure. And I'm not saying don't use HTML to render, but my very hard belief is don't lock yourself down to driving the HTML render as a desktop application. So don't create, don't try to manage the DOM is my theory. Um, a lot of people will disagree with that. I think I'm right, you're probably right too, but I'm gonna stick with my guts on this one. Um, why do you do that? It's because you separate your user interface and your business logic. Right off the bat, you're not tying the two together and that's very important and that was very hard to do. It's very easy to test an API versus a GUI. 
So if you're good at writing business logic and you could test that very easy, there's tooling that lets you do it. Scaling is easy, as uh, Brian was talking about. You got the technology of cloud, Docker, serverless, virtual machines, Lambda, libraries, um, native responsiveness of uh, displaying the stuff. Um, so that's my presentation. I have like a 30 second demo if you want, or, am I, or is it too late? Well, it's coffee time anyway, right? I won't be insulted if you go for coffee. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah, I suppose uh, if you want to see the demo, maybe Norbert's around at the break. I did it. On your little laptop. You did it? It's done. <laughs> it, um...